Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our briefing this morning that EESI is very, very proud to be co-sponsoring with NEMA, the National Electrical Manufacturers Association. My name is Carol Werner, and I'm the Executive Director of EESI, the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And of course, the topic today before us is innovative technologies to strengthen the grid. Last week, we held a briefing looking at resilience, building resilience, building a greater uh, uh, reliability into the grid. So this is a very good follow-up to that briefing. And if you're interested, you can look at that online if you were not able to participate in that one last week. The whole idea that EESI and NEMA really want to help us all better understand our what really is at stake, how this is such an important issue for us all to understand, for policymakers to be aware of, for us to be working with policymakers and the public to better understand what the stakes are, what are the key issues, why do we care, what needs to be involved, and indeed, all of the solutions that are indeed available. So to start us on our journey this morning to kick off our briefing. We are so delighted to have with us Congressman Jerry McNerney from California. And a couple things that I just want to say about him first are that he brings to the Congress some very, very important attributes. I mean, yes, he is a very, very good person. He's smart. He's personable. All of those good things. But he also has a PhD in math. He is an engineer. He has owned, uh, and well, he has operated a wind company, so he has been very, very much on the ground, very, very aware in terms of the whole role of technology, of systems, of systems thinking, how to think about practical solutions, what this country needs to really be economically competitive and to really provide good services, a strong economy, and a strong environment. So we are delighted to have Congressman McNerney kick off our briefing this morning. Congressman. Good morning. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here because of what this uh, meeting represents as, as a step forward in, in a very important technology, a technology that I was deeply involved in uh, in my career before coming to Congress. I did spend a few years developing a smart uh, meter for residential use uh, and uh, uh, um, understanding how that would uh, go to use and how that would be uh, a part of the development of our electric grid was uh, very instructive to me. Uh, the, uh, the electric uh, grid in this country has some very big challenges uh, in terms of meeting the demand, in terms of cybersecurity, in terms of physical security, uh, and um, uh, in terms of providing energy uh, in an efficient way. And uh, smart uh, grid uh, technology can meet and help us meet those needs. And not only that, but it can help create lots of jobs. Uh, and I've seen that happen as well. So uh, whether you're in wind energy and you want to uh, integrate into a system with an intermittent power supply, or if you're a base load like nuclear, or if you're a customer that wants to make sure that your data is secure, uh, the people aren't tapping in and getting your private information, to getting your social security numbers and so on, uh, then, then what we're going to be talking about here today is very important. Uh, it's great to see people that are on top of this, that are uh, going to be supporting it, and they're actually doing the development. So I welcome you here this morning. Uh, and I want to see what happens. And I'm looking forward to your meeting next week as well. So uh, there's a lot of exciting things. You guys are on the very tip of the spear, so to speak. We've got some great panelists that know uh, from their experiences in, in their part of the world uh, how they can benefit and how uh, you can play in this world. So uh, is there anything else? Uh, I, I'd love to see the environmental aspect of the uh, Environment and Energy Study Institute. Uh, we need to reduce pollution. We need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Smart grid technology is going to be a part of that. Uh, and um, providing reliable energy to this country. It's a national security issue. It's an economic issue. Uh, and it's something that we need to take seriously if we want America to continue uh, its role as, as the greatest country in the world. And so thank you for coming and thank you for participating. Thank you for inviting me to say a few words, uh, hopefully, uh, inspire people just a little bit more to get what they're going to get done today. Great. Um, any questions for the 
guess one question I would just put to you is, do, we, do you think that we're going to get any kind, or what's the best way to help with the energy policy? Well, I mean, that's that's a big that's a big question. Uh, energy policy is uh, it's a very uh, controversial. It's very partisan right now. Uh, there's a lot of folks that are worried about the the trend toward a reduction of, of coal and the uh, increase in natural gas. Also, uh, as I mentioned this earlier this morning, nuclear power is going to have to play a role. So, uh, I would just say be involved with your representatives. I mean, get to know who uh, represents you back home. I'll visit them once in a while. Uh, you know, a, a lot of what happens in Washington depends on relationships. A policy is important, but uh, if you know somebody and, and, and they know you and uh, you have something you want them to look at in terms of policy, uh, it's much harder for them to say no when they know you personally than when they don't know you. I just want to say that much. And, and uh, so keep involved, get to know your representatives, uh, understand the policy issues. Uh, I know it's work, but uh, it pays off, and uh, relationships are kind of fun anyway. There you go. <laughs> it doesn't get better than that. Right? Uh, yes, sir. You spoke about reliable energy being an issue. Absolutely. Can you expand that more where you see the biggest threats for national security in this, uh, this frame? Well, uh, yeah, I, I can. Uh, there's, there's a couple areas. First of all, uh, there was a physical attack in a, in a substation in California uh, earlier this year. Our, our, Maybe, might have been uh, late last year, but uh, and uh, just by luck, it, it didn't end up uh, taking down the whole uh, Bay Area uh, electric grid. So I think physical security is very important. We need to understand uh, where uh, our, our, uh, what substations, what power stations are vulnerable, and how to protect them at minimum cost uh, effectively. I think that's probably the, the most immediate thing. We also know cybersecurity is a very uh, potential is a very big potential. Uh, vulnerability that we might have as well. So uh, those two things, um, of course, depending on, on where you are in the country, if you're in New England, uh, you're vulnerable to natural gas supplies. Uh, and, and if you're out west, you know how you have the water issues. Uh, another issue of, of very big uh, vulnerability is, uh, is uh, natural disasters, which we've seen uh, what happened in, in, uh, in uh, Fukushima. Uh, not only affected Japan, but it affected the whole world in terms of Germany deciding to uh, to discontinue using nuclear power. So there's a number of big threats out there that we need to address, and, and uh, that's something that's incumbent upon this group to uh, to, to set your foot into that uh, that frigid water and try and figure out where uh, national policies should go and give us the the results so that we have some guidance. Yes, sir, in the back. Do you see anything that the uh, federal government could do to encourage states to get utilities to harden their grids for EMP or something? That sort of stuff? Well, no, I think that's a, that's a great question. Uh, you know, the federal uh, uh, FERC, uh, uh, their, um, their role would be to give guidance. Uh, but I think the important thing is that we need to have standards that, uh, that states and utility companies can agree to. Uh, and until we have a good set of standards, then it's going to be very hard for the FERC to, to enforce any kind of uh, a meaningful uh, a f reform on a national basis. So I would encourage the, the utility companies to, to move forward in developing those standards. That would be, I think, the most important thing we could do uh, nationally before FERC can actually start taking steps. Sure. Yes, Peter. Well, the answer to that is uh, there is going to be some uh, potential vulnerability. I don't know uh, how. Um, I'm not. I'm not uh, um, well informed on the details of, of those installations to answer your question. But uh, certainly, when you introduce uh, online uh, access from customers, there's going to be some amount of vulnerability, uh, and we need to have the best possible standards and the best possible. Uh, equipment out there to make sure that that, that vulnerabilities aren't uh, exposed and uh, and um, exploited.
Okay, well, you know, uh, uh, we're, we're just uh, uh, establishing the, uh, the bipartisan uh, Smart Grid Caucus in the House. And you might uh, ask your representatives to look into joining that caucus. Um, and uh, it'll, it'll help us move the ball forward and, and keep people informed. And uh, I mean, there's some uh, fear out there that uh, a smart grid uh, is going to lead to uh, uh, the, the, uh, a breach uh, of personal uh, security. Uh, like it might be related to NSA or something, and that's not the case. We need uh, to make sure that people are informed uh, about what the advantages of, of smart grid technology are so that uh, we can continue to move forward in this very important area. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And I'm sure what uh, Congressman McNerney just said with regard to the setting up of a caucus on smart grid fits right in with, um, with something that could be very useful uh, for our next speaker, who is Karen Whalen, who is the Deputy Director for State and Local Cooperation at the uh, uh, Department of Energy and in the uh, Office of Energy Policy and Systems Analysis. In that office and where Karen is, she is um, buried up to her eyeballs, uh, I think, with regard to working on the QER, the Quadrennial Energy Review. And while this is a multi-year process, they are in the process of doing an immense amount of outreach, uh, talking, listening to people across the country coming from every sector of the economy, all sorts of interests and concerns. And again, to really focus with regard to um, concerns about transmission, distribution, uh, how we do this in an efficient, safe, smart, secure way, as well as looking at improvements in overall efficiency and really building for a more uh, uh, resilient and reliable grid and the integration of all of the different kinds of technologies, including an immense amount of renewable energy resources that are becoming available across the country. So Dr. Wayland has a, a long background. She's worked on the Hill in uh, Nancy Pelosi's office when a, uh, uh, Representative Pelosi was, was speaker. Uh, Dr. Wayland was a senior advisor to her. Uh, she has done a lot of work on comprehensive energy legislation. She has worked with private and uh, uh, business and nonprofit clients in terms of providing strategic consulting. And she also had been the legislative director at the Natural Resources Defense Council and has directed Earth and Marine Sciences at, at Earthwatch. So she brings a wealth of experience and exposure on both the House and the Senate side, as well as working with a whole variety of constituencies and people in both the nonprofit and the uh, private sector, the business sector. So, Karen, we're delighted to have you with us this morning. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Carol. EESI, over my many years in Washington working on energy policy, has really been a um, uh, one of the just um, amazing organizations to bring current issues right to the Hill and to, to the public um, with a whole variety. You, you always set up these great um, discussions that really touch on the most current issues of the day. So you provide a great public service. Thank you. And, and we have been very fortunate to work with NEMA on the QER and hopefully much more um, in depth over the coming months because, um, again, your members uh, are doing the things that we're actually sort of touching on at DOE, but you're actually on the ground implementing and installing and deploying uh, innovative technology. So, um, again, and we look forward to building on that relationship in the coming months. Now, as, as Congressman McNerney noted, um, we all are aware that affordable, clean, and secure energy and energy services are really essential for the U.S. economy, for continuing productivity and competitiveness, enhancing our quality of life, and protecting our environment. Um, and recognizing that the federal government does have a role in ensuring those energy services, the President issued a presidential memorandum back in January of this year directing his administration to conduct the first ever quadrennial 
quadrennial energy review. This is a, you know, there are many agencies that do these quadrennial reviews, most notably the Defense Department. Uh, this is a slightly different exercise in that it's an interagency process because there are so many agencies that uh, that have an equity in, in the energy business or in, the ener in, in regulating, developing, supporting energy around the country. So it's an interagency process. Um, and these quadrennial reviews um, are set up to provide a policy horizon, a four-year policy horizon, with a set of uh, recommendations for executive actions, possible um, changes in statute, um, research and development agendas, and a sort of budget and market incentive recommendations. Uh, when, we, when we began this process, and the President directed us to look at all energy infrastructure, we realized that that is a monumental task, um, both b because the energy system in this country is so vast uh, but also because this is the first ever interagency review process. So we kind of redefined the term quadrennial. We are, are going to be looking at pieces of the energy system over the next few years. And the first piece that we're looking at is transmission, storage, and distribution. That's not just wires and pipes. That includes things like um, rails, barges, and truck transport because so much energy project, product is moving that way. Um, so we'll look at transmission storage and distribution this year, um, and then in the coming years we'll look at sort of upstream, downstream, end use, demand response, um, and possibly even looking um, on the third year at supply chains. So it, that is not to say that in this first year we won't be looking at sort of upstream, downstream issues, because clearly transmission storage and distribution is the network that connects all of our, our energy systems. Um, but the recommendations that come out in January um, of 2015 will be focused primarily on, on the transmission storage and distribution network. Um, why did we choose transmission storage and distribution for the first installment? Um, the, the, the reality is that these are fairly inflexible systems that require vast sums of investment on the order of trillions of dollars, and that there is um, a, a certain level of uncertainty um, given the uh, major changes in the energy landscape over the last five years in this country, from the um, new shale gas reserves coming online necessitating pipeline reversals to, um, uh, to the changing role of consumers, distributed generation, um, uh, huge advances in energy efficiency, and basically flat demand. So these, in, in the last five years, this energy, energy landscape has changed, but our energy transmission storage and distribution systems are not set in stone, but they're much more long-lived and, um, and require so sort of long um, investment horizon planning, and we decided that that was one reason why we should start with transmission storage and distribution. Um, and, you know, those, um, at the same time, um, We've begun working on the, uh, with our Office of Science on a quadrennial technology review, which will be of interest to you as well. Um, the Department of Energy did the first ever quadrennial technology review four years ago, um, and we'll be updating that alongside the quadrennial energy review so that we have both a kind of technology-based set of recommendations and this larger policy landscape set of recommendations. We are in the process of um, finalizing our baseline analyses, so looking at the business as usual case for our electricity, natural gas, and liquid fuels pipeline, uh, uh, pipeline systems. Um, we are deep into a whole suite of analyses. Um, including uh, developing metrics for resilience, uh, including looking at, um, given the nature of the regional nature of energy in this country, we're looking at a series of uh, regional fuel resiliency studies. Uh, we're working with our labs on further analyses um, with the goal, again, of having a draft done in time to help um, influence the, um, the next budget cycle. So the final product hopefully will be out in January of next year, but um, some preliminary work will start coming out um, probably in early fall. Uh, in order to um, achieve the goals of the quadrennial energy review, we really need a, um, a robust engagement with external stakeholders. And in fact, the President's memorandum directs us, it has a couple paragraphs that describe um, the kinds of um, really deep engagement we need to have with stakeholders. Everything from tribes, state and local governments, large and small businesses, academics, our national labs, NGOs, labor organizations, and other interested parties. So we have begun um, our what we call our formal stakeholder engagement process, which is a series of meetings around the country focused uh, on specific issues within the transmission storage and distribution um, system, and also, so, so for example, transmission of petroleum products. Um, but also also cross-cutting issues like infrastructure siting and state, local, and tribal issues. We've had three meetings so far. We had one uh, that kicked off here in the um, Capitol Visitor Center um, on vulnerabilities of the energy infrastructure system. 
We held one in uh, New England. It was actually a two-part meeting on infrastructure constraints in New England and Providence and Hartford. And then we just held one recently on petroleum transmission storage and distribution in New Orleans. We've got one tomorrow in San Francisco on the energy water nexus. We'll have one on July 11th in Portland. Uh, we'll have two meetings on electricity, one in the east and one in the west. And the first one we'll hold uh, will be on the west in Portland. Um, if you would like more information on those meetings, uh, you can go to our website at energy.gov slash QER. And we have, for all of the meetings, our goal is to make sure that, that the public is aware and can, be, uh, it can find out any kind of information about who is talking to us about the Quadrennial Energy Review. We want these, these interactions with stakeholders to be transparent. And we have posted um, the uh, transcripts of the meetings. If we video them or live stream them, there'll be links to the meetings. Um, there are statements from from the panelists and, um, and a variety of other information that you can find about all the meetings. Um, so stay tuned because we're going to have a very busy summer with lots of other meetings. Um, we are beginning to look at some of the things that we're hearing from stakeholders and, and, um, and what we're hearing is both reinforcing some of the things we already knew but also bringing to light some new issues. Uh, you won't be surprised that some of the things we're hearing, American utilities provide high quality reliable services, deploying the latest technologies and updating their facilities. Utilities are telling us that they find great value in the public-private partnership between the federal government and the industry, and this is something that Congressman McNerney touched on. Um, what we're hearing is that, um, that working through NERC and then with FERC um, to develop standards for the industry, the industry has found that very useful. Uh, we're hearing that redundancy is essential to maintaining the re reliability in the face of increasing threats of cyber, physical, and extreme weather, and also what we're looking at in terms of an, an additional threat or opportunity, a challenge to the system is the growing interdependency of, of our electricity and um, pipeline systems. But the question becomes the cost of both hardening and redundancy can be significant. Uh, again, the, um, we're hearing that this public-private partnership between industry and government is critical for addressing cyber and physical threats, where the U.S. government has the resources to identify threats and provide assistance in defense of energy systems, but of course the, um, the private sector also has a, a role to play in hardening their systems and, and in sharing their own information with the federal government. Then there's a question about um, balancing information and data sharing with privacy concerns and, um, and liability. Um, we're hearing from, from both um, industry and NGOs that this is an issue. So that points us to some places where we might look at what the role of the federal government is in resolving some of the statutory and regulatory uncertainties about data. Um, we're hearing that we, uh, a lot about grid integration, which is not news to anybody here, distributed generation. Um, we recently heard that even combined heat and power um, presents some issues in, in terms of integration. Um, we're hearing about um, the uh, increased use of microgrids and the, and the challenges and opportunities of microgrids. In fact, on the way here, I was reading an article about a new Navigant study that just came out, um, look, projecting that um, the investments in microgrids in this country will go from $4 billion by uh, to 2020, 20 billion dollars. So, how you bring those um, systems online, how you maintain reliability, how you decide who pays for the cost of both that resilience, that increased resili resilience, but also, you know, the system that it's connected to, are going to be big issues in the in the coming years that we will attempt to tackle through the QER as well. Um, in New England, we heard from a region that's starting to come together around solutions for natural gas and electricity constraints, but we also heard some concerns about balancing the region's long-term uh, greenhouse gas um, goals with increased use of natural gas. And we're also hearing um, about uh, the, the uh, and this is something that we had planned on looking at very closely, is, is the role of energy efficiency and renewables um, in, in avoided infrastructure. We're, um, the sort of kinds of stakeholder feedback we've heard so far kind of fall into three buckets. How to operate the system uh, safely, fairly, and efficiently. Who will be responsible for reliability, safety, and security? And those, those fall into enforcement, new investment, standards, et cetera. And how to allocate costs of resilience measures. I'm sure that over the next few uh, months as we conduct more of these meetings and we begin to sort through the um, 
material that we're getting in our, um, our inbox, we'll have lots more questions to, that we're hearing. Um, finally, we heard a fair amount about electricity during the New Orleans meeting on petroleum transmission storage and distribution. We had one port official note that electricity infrastructure is a weakness in the port system. We had a pipeline executive noting that in his view, the biggest exposure to reliable operation of his company's pipelines is electricity. Um, we heard from panelists who noted the need to encourage investment in the hardening of electricity infrastructure by smaller entities and the need to work sort of county by county or in Louisiana parish by parish to guarantee access after emergencies to help get power restored um, to uh, processing and pipeline systems. Um, you'll probably be interested in a number of the upcoming meetings. Those are, again, I mentioned a few. They're all listed on our QER website. Um, we've got an infrastructure siting um, meeting planned in Wyoming, a gas electricity interdependence meeting in Denver. Um, I mentioned the state local tribal issues. That'll be in New Mexico. Um, and rural electricity issues in Iowa. So stay tuned. And, uh, and I hope uh, that this is the beginning of a, a deep conversation about uh, innovation and how the federal government can help um, incentivize and, and grow that great work. Thank you. And we will undoubtedly want to come back to you later in the year, the beginning of the year, to hear more about what is really coming out of this process and what are the views and, and getting them into this whole discussion up here uh, even further. So thanks for setting that stage. And now to sort of look at some of the opportunities and some of the things that we are seeing uh, uh, become available in, and in terms of addressing some of these questions that are coming available in the private sector, I want to turn first to Ken Gessler, Geisler, who is the Vice President for Strategy and some, the Smart Grid Division in Siemens. He is coming today um, from Minneapolis, uh, where he is located, and he brings over 30 years of management and technical experience in defining, designing, developing, and also implementing large integrated solutions in the energy industry. He had been the chief architect of Smart Grid with Siemens Energy and Automation. He has served in executive roles in other large international engineering companies. So he brings a wealth of experience and is going to really provide kind of an overview of both what Siemens is doing, but kind of looking at the big picture with regard to the challenges and the opportunities that we see moving forward. Ken? Thank you. And thank you, uh, ESI and NEMA, for the opportunity to speak to all of you today. We do appreciate it. Um, we're, we'll start out today a little bit with uh, just kind of getting our bearings. First Siemens is, is a very large uh, international engineering company, as you probably all know, about $100 billion in sales, and in the United States, a little under $25 billion. So very big, a lot of uh, employees here and, and worldwide. And honestly, uh, in a great degree, uh, focused on all the issues that have been discussed this morning, including um, some of the references to the previous meetings were uh, advanced building technologies and efficiencies that you gain out of it, healthcare systems, and others that actually all apply to this, this whole picture. I am with the Smart Grid Division, personally, and, uh, and we work within kind of the energy community, right? So we have large generation, we have um, uh, uh, implementation of control centers, automation products, uh, protection equipment, everything that is necessary actually to drive forward in this market. And that's one thing we'll talk about today a little bit, in that many of the technologies we need to actually modify, modernize, and evolve the grid are, are already in place out there. They're, they're willing and able to be applied in these, in these conditions. So l let's talk a little bit about um, where we are, where we came from, and, and how we got here, and, and, and kind of what, where we are now. Um, the electrical community, the in energy environments that are out there, really grew up out of uh, a few things. Um, originally, it was driven by the uh, industrialization of, uh, of the communities. And uh, what you saw is a lot of heavy uh, industrialized uh, areas that would spring up around city centers. And with that, in the first half of the last century, we always saw, also saw the energization of the family farm. So you had these very highly industrialized downtown areas and long skinny lines that went out into the, the farming community and the mountains to actually uh, 
meet the utility's obligation to serve the environment. In the last part of the last century, we've seen movement toward this suburbanization picture. Whereas people didn't want to live close to where the, all the generation of, of the uh, um, uh, energy was being produced, they also did not want to uh, uh, have their life kind of tied to their jobs. So they, they've spread out. And so we ended up with kind of this energized donut or energized donut hole at any one part of the day where people would drive out to live and the peak goes up and the people would actually you know, move downtown and, and work downtown in order to, um, to ser serve their jobs. So ultimately it became a, a picture of uh, the infrastructure popping up to support the community, better live, work, and play environments. Um, now what we're seeing is what we're calling reurbanization. And reurbanization is kind of a repurposing of the cities and the city centers. And what that does is provides more population living in the cities. We're seeing the infrastructure necessary to be used. But now we have an older infrastructure. We're seeing things that, in fact, are, are unusual to the kind of designs that we have as well, like the capability to utilize technology to offset your, your uh, energy bill. I can put solar on my rooftop. I may have an alternate source of power that I can actually pull together and utilize. I can have um, an electric car, or perhaps I have other technologies that I can apply to make my life different and actually reduce my energy bill. But that has a kind of reverse effect on the utility as well. So what's really happening with the utilities? The utilities themselves have a large centralized energy grid. It goes from the generation on the left of this figure to the transmission, which is a highly interconnected system of high voltage wires and lines, to the distribution system, which tends to be quite radial. So the reliability issues uh, in this kind of a system typically are more focused on the transmission to distribution system and mainly in the distribution system because you have long radial lines that are being served. What's happening is that there's technologies that provide consumers with options. And we're seeing lots more distributed generation go into that. Distributed generation was described before, but one of those aspects is um, solar power on your rooftop. In certain, sit, in certain uh, uh, states, you know, the, the proliferation of solar power due to the state incentives has actually you know, overrun the capability of the utility to support that, that kind of ingestion of renewables within the distribution system. The protection system changes, the safety of the workers and the people are, are put in, uh, in doubt, and the designs need to change. So when we look at that kind of a perspective, it's a change in the distribution design as well as in the, the decentralization of gener generation. When we look at it from that perspective as well, this is probably the biggest change in, you know, since the beginning of the, uh, the energization of the United States. It's the biggest change in the electrical industry in the last 100 years. And so when we look at that and we say, how do we apply that, those designs have to change. But there's billions of dollars of equipment in the ground out there. And so these systems have to evolve from what they are to where they're going to be in a more decentralized view of the world. So rather a large centralized generation and one-way distribution of power, it will go to more of a patchwork quilt of, I've heard the word micro districts or micro grids here. We're calling them energy districts in some senses because micro grids could actually uh, suffice for themselves and live without connection to the utility, at least for some period of time. But there's a variety of technologies going into a generational change. This isn't going to happen over two to five years. You know, this is a 10, 15, 20 year change. And you might say, where's the money coming from? Well, the money is going to come from the utilities shifting their budgets to different designs. They've got 30 year designs that have worked very good in the environment that they've had up till now. But that's changing, and it's changing very rapidly. So as more consumers offset their load, less are there to subsidize the, the rate case, if you will. And we have actually to see what happens to our business models out of this to support it as well. So the utility business models will likely change and need to change in some environment as well. So what are utilities worried about? 
So when I look at a utility, and, and we did a, a survey, or at least we were involved in a survey with uh, Utility Dive, and they ranked a number of, of items as, as to what keeps the utility folks up at night and how do they keep the lights on. And I'm not gonna go through every one of these. You guys can look at the slides. But if I boil it down, I can boil it down into four things. And I heard some of the words uh, mentioned earlier today. Reliability, which is what the utilities are there to provide now. Reliability of electric power for the long term. You know, always on. Efficiency is the next one. Say, so how do I do that effectively and efficiently enough where I can take my existing budgets and I can pair that off into new technologies and new designs that I know have to happen to actually you know, continue to move toward this resiliency picture that we're talking about. Sustainability is the ingestion, if you will, of renewable resource, the integration of renewable resources, so that I'm not actually you know, as dependent as I was on other types of technologies that may not be as clean. And how do I tie in batteries? How do I tie in electric cars? How do I tie in all these other potential sources and sinks of power to actually make this reliability index get to where we need to, to have it be. And then finally, there's resilience. And the resilience is really, how do I sustain a problem? How well do I go through a big event? How well do I consume the problem without affecting you know, a large number of my customers? Or at least, how do I minimize that? And again, this concept of decentralization of generation really actually supports that. One of the problems has been that in the sustainability layer, the utility's not really controlling the decentralized generation. It's going in to offset the energy needs of the, the users. And so without controlling that, it's very hard to dispatch and guarantee reliability. And so there's issues. If then we look at those issues, there's a number of technologies that can support it. The technologies actually that are, are there, are, and this is a kind of an eye chart, so forgive me, but if I look at reliability, efficiency, sustainability, and, resistant, uh, and re resilience, I can actually take a picture and give you some examples where it's going in right now with different technologies. The technologies are approached in the second column for, from the right. Distribution management systems for control centers, substation automation, feeder automation, voltage management, so more automation and more sensing equipment in the distribution network gets us more control and gets us more reliability. It also improves the efficiencies that the utilities are looking for. Sustainability is integration of more and more renewable resources. And finally, the resilience aspects become in how do we actually utilize the generation that's out and in the distribution world decentralized in a more effective way. Just to give you a few examples, like there are utilities that have applied this. So in those reliability and efficiency layers, generally the utilities can fit that within their existing budgets and their existing business models, but they're dealing with a 30-year equipment depreciation model. And that 30-year equipment depreciation model doesn't necessarily account for uh, consumers putting in rooftop solar, it's consumers doing other things to reduce their, their bills. Okay, in fact, they're, they're removing themselves from that aspect of the, uh, the, the rate case. In one case, you have automation, feeder automation, and we'll talk about some of that today. One of our speakers will talk about uh, automation in the distribution network today. In uh, NEC in Virginia, the feeder automation supply that actually minimizes the, the cause of a problem around the, the customers that are affected by it, and actually uh, automates the reconnection of the customers that can be uh, reconnected and maximizes the, the reliability for it. Hawaiian Electric in, uh, in Oahu has put in automation systems in their substations that actually manage those field devices that I just talked about in the field to actually do quite broadly ranging switching operations to improve reliability and efficiencies. They also provide more information back to the control center so I can find the problem quicker and I can fix it faster. So my efficiencies go up. Encore Electric has Im implemented a control center at the distribution level that actually incorporates all these types of equipment. The visibility visualizes it to the operator and helps the efficiencies for the, the utility to address them. 
All those projects, efficiency and reliability, are generally within the budgets of most electric utilities. When you get to the sustainability and resilience and monster changes in design, now we have to find different ways to fund this and different ways to manage it. And I can give you several um, examples of greater sustainability. Parker Ranch in Hawaii, Pantex is a federal uh, uh, military base in, uh, in Texas where they've driven in much wind and solar and other forms of energy and storage actually to improve their, their situations. Co-op City in New York actually was, uh, was the one place or one of the few places in New York City that uh, stood up throughout the entire Hurricane Sandy event because they had generation, it was CHP, combined heat and power. It was also a microgrid. It operated as microgrid. So it stayed up the entire time. Savona, Italy is another example where Siemens actually has put in a, a, a microgrid for the, uh, the university. And it has many of the characteristics that we talked about, distributed generation, storage, and the ability to sustain itself over a period of time. So there's things that we need to think about in this generational change. And as we look at it from a, a congressional standpoint, we have to be able to reduce in some way the utilities' uh, uh, kind of implications of its business model, if you will. Right? It, one way to do that would be to reduce the utility equipment depreciation schedule from the 30-year picture to a smaller number, perhaps five years. This would incent, in fact, the, the use of more automation technologies and investment in the grid. We need to encourage the state regulators to adopt performance race ba uh, based rate making. And that will help, in fact, to also uh, get to these resilience issues and other issues that we've talked about. We want to incent them to put in automation. We want to incent them to put in greater monitoring so I can actually fix problems or even avoid them. And finally, we want to ensure that we have the control and the analytics to ensure safety, the cybersecurity issues, and other things that we talked about. We want to protect the critical infrastructure. This is one of the important ideas of the microgrid. As we move into something like a Hurricane Sandy, where you know, the communities were actually um, in, impacted by this, we start talking about sustainability and resilience. Now you've drawn in other uh, aspects of the community. You've brought in the federal government, the state government. So what's critical infrastructure and how do we ensure that it's going to stay up and running? And that's with local generation and coordinated efforts with the utility. So kind of we're all in the same boat. It's not just the utility now. You get above the reliability and efficiency levels, start talking about sustainability and resilience, and we must actually have that covered by the entire contingent. And finally, there are, are ways of actually going after that. You know, certain uh, um, states have actually installed programs to actually begin to address these issues, as well as if you look at Congressman David Payne's bill, H.R. 2962, it calls for a more preparation, response, mitigate and recover from uh, in disastrous attacks or cyber attacks. So any way that the, the, the uh, uh, system can be attacked and the, uh, the reliability of the, the solutions be um, approached, that is in fact how we're, we're trying to address these issues and all these kinds of things add into it. So with that, I will step down. Thanks very much, Ken. You touched on a whole variety of issues that I think would be great to be able to delve into, and I think it'll be really useful to look at a lot of the examples that you already provided about kind of all of the different aspects that where Siemens is developing and has developed technologies and kind of putting together a whole variety of what I would call kind of hybrid systems in terms of, of many applications being combined to um, address reliability, sustainability, resilience, et cetera. So to drill down a little bit further, we're going to have our next speaker um, uh, talk about what their company, how, how they are beginning to address this, and it's, and it's another example um, of what they are doing. And we're going to hear from Anil 
uh, Dawan, who is a senior electrical engineer with Commonwealth Edison, or as we all know, ComEd, uh, coming to us today from Illinois. And Anil is a senior engineer in distribution standards and engineering organization. And he's currently is serving as the technical subject matter expert supporting equipment design and standards. Back to thinking about performance again. Failure analysis, and we clearly want to avoid those failures, um, and construction and maintenance activities for distribution and automation related equipment. Uh, so, Anil, we welcome you. Thank you, Carol. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anil Dewan, as Carol mentioned. I work for Commonwealth Edison in Chicago. I was asked at least to give you a very high-level overview of our Energy Infrastructure Modernization Act and also the smart grid that we have programmed at the Commonwealth Edison. Briefly, um, we, are, we are excellent utility company. Uh, we are the largest integrated energy provider in the United States. We serve about 6.6 .6 million customers. We have BGNE, that's in Baltimore. It serves about 1.2 million customers. PICO is 1.6 million customers. On the other hand, Commonwealth Edison has 3.8 million customers. Out of those, 1.1 is just city of Chicago. Our service territory is 11,300 square miles. And our peak load was back in July 20th, 2011, was 23,753 megawatt. It was a hot summer. It was hot. <clears throat> so we talk about smart grid. Uh, there are many definitions out there. So what is smart grid? Uh, smart grid basically, in the simplest term, is electrical grid that uses information and communication. And they work together to improve the efficiency, reliability, and sustainability of the system. Uh, it's much more efficient than the convention method that we have, uh, the way that we deliver the services. So if something happens right now, so you have to call, it takes hours to get your power restored. But with this, we can do that in seconds or in minutes. In some cases, you will see that in a later slide. So what is Smart Grid? How is it all done? Smart Grid is basically a series of smart devices that put together. Uh, we have automated switches, uh, 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 microprocessor relays, uh, distribution automations, smart substations, that we have the AMI meters. So basically those are the meters that we're going to talk about and how it's going to help us with the key components of the Smart Grid. Uh, what this will do is Smart Grid will empower customers with information and ability to control energy and consumption and the cost. So back in 2011, when ComEd decided to embark on this to enhance the uh, system, uh, Illinois General Assembly enacted the Energy Infrastructure Modernization Act called, also known as EMA. Uh, I know most of you guys from the federal side, but it was a well thought through uh, uh, legislation, and I hope your state will also at least adopt some portion of it. The main goal with this legislation was to address the four things. The regulatory reform, that was a key component of it because we talked about the funding, that we have to have the funding. Reliability performance <coughs> matrix, so we'll talk about that. Infrastructure modernization and smart grid investment. The prior model that we have, it was 100 years old. Uh, it was developed by the ComEd founder, Sam Insole. The model was good, but it was very unpredictable and inadequate. Uh, in some years that we got the return as high as 82 percent, and some years we got as a low as 17 percent. So when we had the 82 percent, we did have the appetite to invest money into it, which we did. We started upgrading of a 34 kV system. Well, with the years that we have 17 percent, I don't think that any company will invest if the rate of return is only 17 percent. So one of the uh, one of the distinctive uh, features of this. The new uh, EMA was, uh, it was a performance-based. Uh, this performance-based formula rate has been used by FERC, the Federal Regulatory Commission, for many years. The best thing about this uh, uh, 
the, the best thing about this is a predictable and repeatable. So basically, if you do the performance and you show them that you have met all the metrics, you will get at least a reasonable rate of return. So this, I think, is the, one of the best uh, solution out there. So I talked about the, the performance formulas, the, what it is. So basically, if you take a look at it, it starts in April. And if everything goes well, I mean, it's not like you submit the bill and you get the money. You have to meet all the performance of the matrices. And by the, it takes about a year. If you take a look at this, I'm not going to go through the whole slide. But it takes about a year. If everything goes well, the new rate goes in effect in January 1st. Just to show you some of the progress that we had done, it's only been two years. Uh, we have seen that we have avoided the interruptions, about a half a million customers in 2012, 2013. And also the frequency, the time, the, basically how many times you have an outage has reduced by 15%. The KD, I think that's one thing that you guys must be worried about because it takes time to restore your power and that's had reduced by 27%. The other thing that we talked about earlier has created about 2,800 full-time jobs uh, in 2013 alone. And we also have pumped in about $1.5 billion in supply chain in the, into the Illinois economy. So how are we investing our money? <clears throat> Basically, we have two parts. One is $1.3 billion in infrastructure upgrades. That's what we have underground cables, so that's the heart of it. And then we have 69 kV transmission cables, wood poles, storm hardening, and also we're building a training centers as well for the workforce because we're going into the smart grids. The other side, we have $1.3 million into smart grid upgrades. Uh, that way comes into distribution automation. Eric will talk about a little more how we accomplishing all that. And also we have a data communication and the AMI meters that we talked earlier, and then you will get to see how it's going to help us all. So what is distribution automation? In the simplest way it says, it automatically identifies, isolate, and restore power. Right now if you have a power outage, you have to call the company, they will send someone out there, the first responder, by the time it's said and done, it takes hours. But with this, we can do in some cases into cycles, seconds, or in some cases in minutes. The way we're doing it is we are upgrading our system with the 20, 2,600 devices. We're trying to install 2,600 devices. Um, what we're trying to have a 500 to 750 customer base segment, because right now some of the features are so long that you have 2,000 or 2,500 customers. So if you have a problem in one of the section, so all 2,500 customers are out. So with this, the additional 2,600 devices that we're going to install, basically it's going to help us to be segment to 500 to 750. We also try to enhance our communication system. We talked about that, show you a little more. As I said earlier, that we, back in when we had some money, we started upgrading our 34 KB. Now we have to have a new software, so we try to upgrade that as well. Everyone's concern is cybersecurity. I just wanted to emphasize that cybersecurity, every device or every hardware or software that we do is built in security. And also, we do not share any data. We respect the customer privacy. So if someone wants to have to share the information with someone, it has to go through a lot of hoops to get that done. We do not share any information. Also, the, any of the transactions are done is very similar to the ATM that you guys do, and I think it's very square. The last, lastly, the key component of this is smart meters. Uh, we talked about that. We're trying to replace over 4 million uh, meters. Uh, presently, we have done about 300,000, and the goal is by 2018. I know it's at a 2021, but now we're trying to accelerate to 2018 to replace all 4 million customers. The meters that you see on the top is a static meter. It's a standalone. There's no communication built into it. If you have an outage, we don't know. You have to call us. But with the smart meters, we'll know that you have an outage. We'll be able to ping you. We'll say, okay, you and out. We'll try to send someone out there to fix it. Plus, uh, plus this will also give us a system reliability and our customer satisfaction as well. Um, I know I talked a lot about it, uh, but I just wanted to leave you with a video that will summarize everything that I just talked about. I hope it will help. But there we do have websites. If you guys want to go visit it, 
uh, ComEd and ICC, it gives you a lot more information. And hopefully this video will visualize it. But once we get done with this, I think this, everyone will benefit it. Thank you very much. Complete with digital devices and automated controls that will help us monitor the flow of power on electric lines and automatically reroute power to minimize the number and duration of outages. This demonstration shows how Comet's smart grid, when complete, can dramatically improve our ability to quickly restore your power during a lightning storm. In 2010, ComEd deployed more than 120,000 smart meters, a key component of our smart grid, in Oak Park and Maywood. On July 28, 2011, two waves of severe lightning storms moved through this area from 4 to 6 a.m., carrying over 5,700 lightning strikes represented by the yellow marks. As power was disrupted, smart meters provided the exact location of outages, indicated in red, before many customers called them in. This is particularly important because many of these customers may have been asleep and unaware that their homes had lost electricity. The smart grid's automated controls are alerted to the problems on the system and automatically reroute power to help restore 70,000 outages, which are indicated in green. After the storm passes, ComEd can use smart grid data to know which homes are still without power, enabling ComEd crews to coordinate a more effective response. Since data from the grid can also alert ComEd when power has been restored, ComEd crews stay on the job until all outages are resolved. Rapid response, that's the power of smart meters and ComEd's smart grid. Great, thanks so, thanks so much, Anil. And I think it's also really useful to um, show a, a kind of uh, uh, the representation of that uh, with, with that um, short video. I remember a few years ago, um, living here in the district and also having been subjected to several multi-day power outages and being flabbergasted to learn that the utility didn't know that everything had to be called in, uh, thinking, how can this be, you know, at this, at the, in this day and age? And so I think it's so important in terms of as we all get better information and learn how things work and what really is available and how we can all see performance improve um, across the board, which also can mean, obviously, it's, it's important for all of us, but when you look at so many businesses where if anything is down for any period of time at all, that the economic loss is, is huge. So now we're going to take another look at uh, a technology, sort of we're going into for uh, yet another deeper dive here. And for this, we're going to hear from Eric Keller, who is with G&W Electric out of Bolingbrook, Illinois, and where he is an automation engineer in distribution automation at G&W Electric. Eric is responsible for power system automation specification, also for its design, its factory acceptance testing, and also for its site commissioning. He had been um, employed for seven years prior to going to G&W uh, to, at, at ZIV USA, also at um, uh, an Illinois company, where he again provided a lot of technical support and project commissioning and training for utility employees. So all of these things are very, very important in terms of really helping in terms of the design and the execution, the implementation, and I think it's really important to understand how important the adequate training is for everybody. So Eric is going to talk to us about one of these technologies. And again, I want to help, help all of us remember that this is like an example of a multitude of technologies that are all involved in terms of addressing these issues of resilience, reliability, efficiency, sustainability. Thank you, Carol. As you, as you mentioned, I'm going to get into a bit more of the details on one of the components of the smart grid, automatic reclosers. 
how they work and how they improve the availability of electric power on our distribution systems. Uh, first thing to notice while I have the introduction slide, uh, these are devices that are out on the electric power lines that are 30 to 40 feet up in the air, they're outside, they're subjected to all of the elements from storms, uh, there can be problems also from, uh, from wildlife and also from human accidents, cars can hit telephone poles, etc. Uh, and I, as we, before I get into it, I'll, I'll define some of the technical terms I'll get into. Any of those problems can be defined as a fault. Uh, and a fault is essentially like a, a short circuit that you have in your house. Um, I'll also talk about loads, which can be hospitals, neighborhoods, uh, factories, etc. Uh, as we look at this, you'll see that there are, are wires going into and out of each of these. There's typically three, and those are, those are called conductors or, or the power line itself, typically made of metal. And uh, those actually supply the pathway for the power. So I'll talk just as briefly about who G&W is and some of the things we make for the smart grid besides uh, reclosers. Look at the uh, basics of the recloser just briefly and then look at some of the applications. These will be the, the real life applications, both of standalone reclosers that are being used now, as well as reclosers and systems with or without communication. So GNW is a Chicago-based company. We started with two ComEd engineers back in 1905. Uh, we've always been a Chicago company. We now recently moved into bigger and larger headquarters uh, in Bolingbrook, Illinois. We, uh, we also have, besides the reclosers, we also have switches that are for underground power lines, as well as terminations and, and high-powered fuses for de delivering power. Uh, besides our, our headquarters in Illinois, we also have international manufacturing in Brazil, Mexico, Canada, and China. And I work in the automation department, uh, which helped to develop the, the newer feeder automation, the distribution automation uh, for ComEd's reclosers. This is one of the pictures from the, the automation pilot that we had. Uh, we, have, we have reclosers installed in all 50 states of the U.S., uh, more than 30,000 installed worldwide, 85% of which are in the U.S., and we're all manufactured in our Chicago-based facilities. Uh, some of our larger customers include Exelon Utilities, including ComEd, uh, BG&E, and Pico, as well as uh, Alabama Power, AEP, which is American Electric Power, uh, National Grid, and, and Progress Energy. Moving on to the, the recloser itself, this is a brief anatomy of, of the recloser. Uh, one of the things to notice, there are, as we saw in the first picture, this is, there are, uh, this is the entrance of the power. It goes into this connection or bushing, and then through this interrupter, which is a, a open and close point, and then out through the other bushing uh, to another conductor that would be facilitating the uh, routing of power. As we're looking at, at whether power is available and how much is flowing through the recloser, uh, we have what we call current transformers that tell us the, the amount of power that is flowing through. If there's too much power flowing through, it's typically due to a, a problem on the system, and we will then open up. Some of the newer innovations in reclosers coming up these days, <clears throat> we now have voltage sensors integrated not only on one side as in the past, but now also integrated on both sides of this recloser, which tells you if it, if it happens to be open, it, it allows you to know whether there's voltage or presence of power on one side versus the other. The other newer innovation is rather than having one three-phase or three-module device that would be acting together, opening and closing all three uh, phases at once, now we have independent modules, and what that allows us to do is, is we may have power lines that that come out of the recloser and feed different neighborhoods, for instance. Uh, they may th feed three different neighborhoods. If we have independent acting recloser modules, we can actually isolate a problem in one area and leave the other two areas untouched. We have a, a bit of a video to let you know what the recloser looks like as it operates. Uh, you'll see the, the middle phase will operate, the middle pole will operate, and then... 
There's a bit of noise that goes with it too. <laughs> As we dive into some of the technical examples, you can keep in mind and have a tangible idea of what these look like when they operate. The first example that we'll show, there we are. This is, uh, this is where reclosers have been widely used for the last many years. Uh, and this is as a, a standalone operation. In this case, we have a, we have a source, which is the, the power, all of the, the transmission and distribution leading up to this point. Uh, and it is isolated from the, the load or the power user at the end uh, by this recloser. So if there is a, an issue, say a tree falls on one of the lines, uh, or there's some kind of wildlife on the line, there will first be a fault. The recloser will detect this and open to isolate the problem. And then, as, a name, as its name implies, it will reclose to attempt to feed power again. And if the problem still exists, it opens once again. And in this case, if the, if the fault goes away, or it's cleared by either, in the wild case, wildlife case, burns off, or a tree lets go, uh, then <laughs> if, if it blows away, uh, then, then now we, the fault is cleared. And when we finally close again, now we can successfully feed power again to the users. And this is important because in the past, either we would have a fuse that would have to burn and open, and then you'd have to, as Anil said, the customer would have to call that problem in. Uh, you send out a, a truck and they replace the fuse. The other option is that you would actually isolate further upstream at the substation, uh, and that would actually subject more customers to this problem. So the recloser allows you to isolate problems to a smaller area. This is a recloser acting as, as a system. Uh, this particular example is from ComEd's loop scheme uh, logic or automation that we, that we uh, assisted them with. And now what we have is additional reclosers to help segment the power distribution grid. So again, we have a fault that's in this particular location between the first recloser and what we call the sectionalizer. That recloser will open up again, as it did before. It'll close to attempt to feed power again, opens again, closes again, and finally opens and does what it, what's called locking out. And when it locks out, this is when it, it stops trying to reclose it's actually going to stay open and something further needs to be done to repair that line or isolate it. In this case with automation, now we have the next device down the line, which is called the sectionalizer. It senses that loss of power and opens after 45 seconds to isolate this faulted section. And that allows the tie 15 seconds later to close because it sees an alternate source from the other side but a, a deadline still, that the neighborhood or sources, or that the load there is still dead, it can close to refeed that power from the alternate source. And this can all be done within approximately one minute, rather than in the past it may have been done by, by utility crews in, a, in hours. This can now be done in time scale of one minute. The final example of some of the projects that, that are existing uh, is another automation example about using communication now. And what we'll see in this case, we'll see if one of the sources is lost, in this case source one, uh, we will sense that from the recloser that's on source one, and then we'll be able to close at that tie to feed the load that was previously connected to the first source, its preferred source, or normal source, it'll be fed from an alternate source. And this can be done much more quickly. 
And I'll show, this is animated in, in real time. We'll see the recloser will open after five seconds of loss of power, and then the tie will close another two seconds later. Source one is lost. The recloser counts to five seconds and then opens. And now the tie is counting two more seconds and it closes. And now we're, we've, able, we've been able to reroute power from an alternate source in order to feed both of our loads automatically. And using communication, while it takes a little bit more technology to achieve this, automation and rerouting of power can be done in, in fewer than 10 seconds rather than in a time scale of one minute. I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to speak a bit about reclosers as uh, one part of the smart grid. Thank you, Chair. And I must say, it's always really interesting to see how this stuff works and how all of these things can be put together to uh, really improve things. And until we were working with NEMA in terms of organizing this briefing, I didn't know about reclosers and how this whole role that they played, how it worked. And, and, uh, and as he made clear, this is, when we talk about a smart grid and what does it mean, it means a whole lot of things. It's a whole raft of different kinds of technologies work needing to work together uh, in many, many different kinds of applications. So let's open it up for your questions or comments. And if you could just identify yourself, please, if you have a question. Okay, uh, we'll start back here and then we'll come up to you. Hi, my name is Sam. I'm an intern with Justin, political person. My question is primarily for Dr. Whalen or anybody who chip in. Um, can you talk about how the fragmented and privately held nature of the nation's power grid is a challenge, A, for uh, renewables, and B, for cybersecurity, and what DOE is doing to overcome that, and then B, uh, how you're overcoming those challenges in an environment with very little federal funding? That's that's a very good question. Uh, and and um, one of the reasons that during the QER we're doing so much work um, outside the DOE building is that, as you know, so much of the assets in our energy system are held in private hands. And so, uh, and not only are they held in private hands, they are largely um, regulated and developed at either the regional level when it comes to sort of electricity and the RTOs or at the state level by the PUCs. So we're really trying to figure out what exactly the federal levers are and how those um, federal authorities overlap with um, the regional and state authorities. So one of the things we've done is look at this kind of regulatory baseline. What are the roles of the different entities? And, and um, what is that environment that, the, that uh, private industry, that private assets um, have to consider when they're deciding how to make investments? So it, it is a, um, you know, peeling apart the layers of the onion is something that we're in the process of doing, and, and we're asking the question to stakeholders, where are the bottlenecks? Where are the places where we can try, as a federal government, to smooth out um, these sort of uh, different layers, um, different environments across the states, um, even within the federal government, conflicting um, agendas, priorities, um, processes, to try to address um, exactly what you're getting at it, which is we have um, emerging vulnerabilities that um, clearly our system needs to adapt to, and how can the federal government best respond to that? So I don't have specific answers for you right now because I don't want to predetermine the kinds of recommendations that we're going to make. But but you're you are focused in on a huge issue that that we're grappling with. The grid today is safe. We're getting safer. Um, as to the, the, I'm, I'm a college student, it's the point where in my foreign relations class we're talking about uh, Chinese attempts to undermine the power grid and uh, it's concerning. I think we're all concerned, and I think that's why the president directed us to, to undertake this, this exercise. But, but I will say that um, there, there's a lot of work going on in this area, both in the federal government and the private industry. I mean, that this is not this is not an area that is not that is unexplored, and uh, it, it leads me to note that we will likely have a classified section of the QER dealing specifically with the uh, um, cyber and physical threats. That okay, uh, we'll come here first, Peter. Yes, Peter. Uh, 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 without getting ahead of the QER, are there strategies you're seeing? funding a significant increase in redundancy that could help protect the grid against uh, 
a low probability that there's a potential high impact uh, issues like school storms or cyber attacks or even solar. You know, those are um, all things that we're looking at. I, I should have, you know, when we were looking at um, the range of, of vulnerabilities um, and then the kinds of scenarios that we'll be modeling, we'll be looking at things like, um, some call them black swans, some are now calling them black sky events like electromagnetic pulses and huge storms or a, a terrorist threat. So we will be looking at those. Um, one of the teams that we have working on the QER is, is very much focused on markets and incentives. So that's one area that they are going to be looking at. Is, and, and as I mentioned, it is the big question that both the federal government, states, and the private industry are grappling with, which is what is, and you've heard it, you've he heard it from other panelists and from Congressman McNerney, what, what kind of rate structure do we need to actually address these new issues of hardening and building and resilience? So um, I, I don't want to get ahead of the QER um, in terms of, of saying whether there's a better model out there, but as you know, there are a lot of people working on that, both from from the industry and from uh, the federal government sector. Uh, there was a question over here. Okay, back here. Uh, oh, thank you. Nicole Cedar-Raman from the DC Office of the People's Council, and I have a question for Mr. Dolan from ComEd. Two questions, actually. Um, the first is, what type of consumer education plan uh, does ComEd have for educating ratepayers about AMI? Um, and, and how's that working for you all? And then uh, secondly, um, what's happening generally in Illinois around uh, incorporating time varying rates or dynamic pricing to get the most out of um, AMI? I might not have the exact answer for all those two questions. Uh, with this AMI, we have a very PI program that we have been educating our customers. Uh, in order for us to install that we do go into, we hold the hearings and we do educate our customers in that sense. Uh, regarding the other question that you had, um, I have to get back to you. I do not have an exact answer for that. Okay, the back. Uh, Terry Hill with the Passive House Institute. We now have capabilities of building and retrofitting existing buildings to be very energy efficient. They can drastically change the load on the utility grid. And given the tremendous amount of investment that is about to be required to rehab the grid and to make it more resilient, is anybody taking a clean slate approach to the design of the grid? Um, taking into, into account these new ways to be very efficient on the building side? Thanks. Yes, I, I think there's, you don't see a, a, a pervasive, um, at least from my experience, you don't see a pervasive thought of it. I mean, in, to your point, some of the, the biggest um, demand response resources that you can get are some of the big buildings down here in the, in a city and that is an excellent resource to go after for a, a utility and and the the building designs um, and the building systems out there are, are quite effective to to go after that kind of a, a capability the integration with the utility in a program is perhaps the hard part of that it's not so much the technology it's what's the program that's going to incent the membership in in a uh, you know the enrollment in a program that will actually go after getting that those uh, those capabilities. So that's one thing that you can go after. That is what I would call low hanging fruit. The technology is there. The integration and communications is, can quite simply be done. We did a a, a, a job with uh, Con Edison in New York, and uh, they were actually wanting to go after some of the buildings in Manhattan to be able to reduce their loads to address operating issues. And, and when we looked at it, there's about, just from Siemens' standpoint, Siemens has uh, building management systems in about 70 buildings that are above a megawatt in downtown Manhattan. If you think that a building management system can get you a rule of thumb about five to 10% energy efficiencies, if I dial it down, um, you know, five to, uh, uh, five to ten percent on seventy megawatts in 
downtown Manhattan is three and a half to seven megawatts. That's a lot of megawatts to go after. So those kinds of things, once they actually started evaluating them, even without a lot of sensing devices in the, the network, they could see where they did have substation metering, what was being affected by it. And so they could very well see how to dial it down. But this is just a, an example, right? These are the buildings, and you're absolutely right on the building efficiencies, because you get 30 to 40 percent efficiency on a building that you're renovating, right? Now, you're building uh, from, from scratch, you don't have that. But if you're renovating building, 30, 40 percent. One of the other things you can think about doing, though, is tying in the other parts of the city infrastructure that are big energy users. For example, like the water systems. Water pumping and water treatment uh, are the single largest uh, uh, usage demand in any city. I think bar none, any city. And yet they are typically not coordinated with the electric utility. So their usage is easily shifted. It's a, it's a big battery storage capability, if you know what I mean. You can easily shift pumping loads to off hours. You can avoid peak times. You can uh, address operating problems through it, but there's very little integration between multi-utilities in most cities. It's a really, really good point. Karen, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I will say that that's actually one of the scenarios that we'll be looking at, which is the effect on uh, of high and, and low efficiency on the um, transmission distribution and storage networks. And, and then also, what, uh, what would happen in terms of a breakthrough technology and storage to the, um, the kind of grid architecture? Uh, may I add something? You know, to, but to that point, like we talk about the efficiencies of, of storage, you know, a lot of storage is pretty good right now. You know, everyone always talks to me about utility scale storage. And I say, well, what exactly is that? Is it a megawatt or above? Um, I can take a 500 megawatt battery system and I can integrate it with my rail systems that are out there, my rail substations. And when I have a frequency problem or a voltage issue, I can move on to my battery supply and I can support that substation for you know 10 or 15 minutes. That's more than adequate for the kind of battery storage that's out there. It's just that you don't like the building management systems that you were pointing out. You don't see that because it's not common practice yet. But there are utilities doing it right now. Great. Okay. Here first. Hi, uh, my name is Ryan Saunders. I work, for, I'm an intern for Senator Schatz in Hawaii. Um, and I guess I have a couple of questions directed at uh, Mr. Geisler and Mr. Dawan. Um, so f Hawaii is one of the states where um, solar power has been maxed out and Hawaii is trying to build its renew renewable energy portfolio. And storage of energy has actually been looked at for, um, especially for wind turbines and wind farms. Um, what can you tell me about what has um, been happening in regards to um, systems that manage loads that fluctuate and also for storage facilities because we had, we've had accidents in the past and wanted to know if that record had been improved or if anything's been updated since then? Yeah, the, the, uh, the accidents you're referring to, I think, are the fires that were with, uh, associated with the battery technologies, and that particular vendor is out of business right now. So, yes, there's been an improvement in the... In the <laughs> That's one way to accomplish it. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, that, this is a great example. I work a lot with Hawaii Electric, Maui Electric. Um, we also actually just completed, a, you may have noticed Parker Ranch on the one slide. Parker Ranch is the, the biggest cattle ranch in, uh, um, in the Hawaiian Islands, and it's on Big Island. And they're trying to cope with their rate issues and how they approach their rate issues. So I don't know what you all pay in uh, Washington, D.C., what your kilowatt hour rate is. Mine in, in Minneapolis is anywhere from 8 to 10 cents about, you know, I mean, on a good day. And... Uh, in on the Hawaiian Islands, the rates are anywhere between 35 to 50 cents a kilowatt hour. So take your, if I take my bill and I multiply it by four or five a month, that's what the Hawaiian Islands are paying. Right? So that kind of an interesting perspective to put on it when you start looking at it that way. If you look at some of the examples of efficiencies and resilience that um, I had up with uh, Hawaiian Electric, for example, they, um, 
they put in a, a automation system, not unlike the, the ones that are being described with the, the reclosers, but these were actually to uh, automate the entire east side of, of the island. And this was in the event of the loss of a few lines that would, in fact, cause a four to six hour power outage for a, a significant part of uh, Honolulu, Waikiki, and the east end of the island. And generally, you know, when those events had occurred, it had been anywhere from two to six hours that the outage times would last right. because it's in the mountains and you've got guys driving trucks and hiking through the mountains and helicopters flying over looking for where the problem is. So what we did is in a DOE funded program, by the way, DOE funded program, and tying it all together here. Um, so in a DOE funded program, uh, we, we designed and helped them build out an automation scheme that uh, reconnected all that interest, or all those customers through the 46 kV infrastructure. So the 138 kV lines, two of them large ones that feed that end of the island, if you lose both lines, 46 hour outage. The automation in this uh, example reduced the outage time from to about four to six minutes depending on the, the, the issue that was arisen. And to the point of, of uh, some of our other speakers as well, you know, we, we talk about being able to switch in minutes now versus having a guy go out in the field and search for the problem and isolating the smallest part. We, we are actually better than that. We can, we can switch in milliseconds, seconds in milliseconds. There's no question the technology is there, but it's a, it's a cost increment that goes up. If you go to the other islands, by the way, like Big Island, where it's more like 45 to 50 cents a kilowatt hour, um, there are other things you can do. The, the wind regime on Big Island is the best in the world, literally. You know, there's probably 500 megawatts of wind on Big Island. And too bad there's not a lot of population there, but, <laughs> but you know, building out along those lines, um, you, you can get very creative because there's also a lot of elevation on Big Island. And because of that, you can build, and they've already built, hydro storage. And so you can have pump storage that actually works, right? It's not unlike the, you know, I'm going to pump seawater and put it in a, and try to use it because the, the economics don't work. But you have some elevation, like on Big Island, you had some very, very good possibilities, which we talked to your governor and your PUC folks about, so. One uh, just last thing. Yeah. So there is a lot of potential, obviously. Yeah. Um, and what does the situation look like to you in managing? Because we don't have very much of a grid, obviously, from island to island. We are pretty isolated. Um, in terms of reliability and being able to switch back and forth between sources that aren't uh, steady, is that what, what improvements have been made recently? Yeah, the, the, the comment about the pumped hydro, it, what you need is a, a firming capability for the generation. And so the pumped hydro, at least on Big Island, could begin to, to get you that. But I think the other problem there is not so much necessarily the, uh, that aspect of it. I, 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 it is an aspect of it, but one of the problems there is you have aging generation, right? So if we take any u utility, any utility, right, and we say, okay, I am now an integrated generation transmission and distribution utility, and in any utility where that's the case, in any state where that's the case, then the largest part of the rate base is the generation by far and away. So given that, when you, you look at it, you say, well, what are the possibilities? One is to separate generation from transmission and make it competitive. On an island, that doesn't, that's not so easy, right? Because there's not a lot that are gonna come in and do it, so you're probably still gonna end up with a regulated base, which says you really have to look at how do I incent the utilities to invest, right? And so that's all within the business model. A 30-year depreciation model doesn't work very good. Five-year, 10-year, better, right? other forms of incentives to do it. I mean, why is there so much solar in, in Hawaii? Because the sun's out a lot? No, because there's giant state incentives that allow the people who had the money to put the solar in to actually put it in, right? right. You, know, where, where's, you know where the second largest influx of, of uh, solar power is? You guys have an idea? New Jersey. Why? Because state incentives put it out there. Great stuff, but the utility then goes, wow, my rate base is, is decreasing, 
And, you know, the, the, it's, it's all interconnected problems. And that's why I was saying before, it's, it's, we're all in it together. You start getting into the levels of sustainability and, uh, and resilience, and it's, it's the, the utility, it's the city, it's the state and federal government, and beyond that, it's the community. Somebody was talking about engaging the community. Here's a great topic to engage the community, and the islands are seeing it first because they're living with monster rates. So you have two things on, on the end of the scale. On the economics is one driver, right? And so you see that in the islands all the time. It's a, it's a huge driver. But the flip side is resilience. And where do you see that? The East Coast. Why? Because Hurricane Sandy came through, and we saw places like Co-op City stand up through the whole thing. This decentralization idea incorporates generation. So if, for example, utilities could own distribution assets that were generation and claim them as a distribution asset in the rate base, well, that's one way of, of meeting that problem, right? But there are other ways of meeting that problem. So, you know, it, it, it depends. You can, it depends on where you are and what you're doing. And arguably, there are different me arguably there's different methods of doing it. But the Hawaiian Islands are in it now. Most islands are in it now. Puerto Rico. You know, you get the same issues going on there. Great. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, go ahead. Doug Obi with Inside EPA Clean Energy Report. Uh, in terms of Capitol Hill, I know the perception is you might be choosing between stasis and gridlock, but that said, anyone who wants to opine on this, uh, what do you see as the short to medium term opportunity to push these issues on Capitol Hill and what is the congressional role in absence of a big energy bill before the elections? Yeah. I don't know whether, does anybody want to say anything? Otherwise, we'll turn to NEMA and I'll ask Jim Creevy to make a comment. Okay. Uh, Jim Creevy with NEMA. Oh, Jim, uh, do you want to come up here? The Congress has uh, moved energy efficiency forward um, through the Shaheen Portman bill here in the Senate. Um, it's got stuck on the, on the Senate floor uh, to this point in time. But it seems like energy efficiency is one of those areas where there's broad bipartisan support for it. It's just a matter of, of uh, overcoming the political barriers to passing a bill. Um, there have not been a whole lot of energy bills uh, going through the Congress in recent years. And so uh, members of Congress on both sides are, are seeking energy, the energy efficiency bill is a vehicle for um, um, other amendments that they would like to, to see considered by the Congress. So it's created some political uh, difficulties for the bill, but none of it has to do with the, the content of the bill itself. Uh, energy efficiency is broadly supported, um, and energy efficiency applies to the grid as much as it applies to uh, buildings and homes. And I would just add, the House has been moving some small energy efficiency bills um, as, as, discrete, as, as discrete items. And, and one of the things that I think is important is that they are, uh, continue to be, uh, even though large bills are not, have not moved out of the Congress with regard to energy, at the same time, there are continuing bills that are being uh, introduced, and I think the more discussion there is, and as Congressman McNerney said, it's very, very important that policymakers are aware of of these connections, of of what the problems have, you know, are and have been, and that there are a wealth of technologies and systems through which to address them that can actually improve the overall reliability, resilience, and therefore the, um, the overall economics um, uh, that we need in terms of running the, the, um, uh, the country. So I think it's sort of incumbent upon us, just as we were hearing this morning in terms of looking at all of the different things that really are available, how they can work together, um, getting to know, hearing from people who have a lot of expertise in the development and the um, implementation of them and how things can work together and need to work together and that there are a host of things that are currently available but just aren't deployed nearly as much as what they could be, which could greatly improve our whole system if they did. And the QER is also another huge mechanism through which this is trying to be addressed. Um, 
Anything that anybody wants to add to that? Well, then we all have lots of work to do. And, uh, but, I, but I think, you know, too, it sounds like that, again, policy is important. It's something that we're hearing that is making a difference because in terms of helping people, at the, at, whether it's at the state level, the local level, or at the federal level, come together to understand what really is available, how it can address problems, and what, therefore, we all need to do working together to move things forward. So I want to thank this wonderful panel. And thank you all very, very much for coming. The briefing will be, uh, the video will be up on EESI's website. So please take a look. And then also, as you heard about, um, you know, things that happened during Sandy where Co-op City stood up, I would call your attention to last week's briefing that we did. Uh, looking again at reliability and resilience and security issues. But also, last year in May of 2013, we did two briefings that are available on our website that looked at situations where um, uh, companies and like Princeton University, for example, stood up during Hurricane Sandy. Take a look so that you can see why. And it comes right back to the issues that we were all talking about today. So thank you very, very much for being here and um, look forward to seeing you again.